Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for being here today. And thank you to the BRCCH for hosting this event. Um, so I'm Gillian Levine. I'm at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. And my work really focuses on uh, tools and then um, assessments of those tools to try to improve the quality of care, specifically for sick young infants and newborns in low resource settings. And I'll talk today about uh, a number of different projects um, which are all linked around this topic. So I'll share very briefly some background to help to motivate the potential opportunity of digital tools for improving the care of sick young infants. I'll share about the BRCCH project overall and some preliminary results of the studies. And then talk about what comes next in terms of how we interpret and understand those results moving forward for uh, new projects and potential opportunities for interventions. So I know that everyone here in this room cares a lot about child health or you wouldn't be engaged in a BRCCH project or interested in coming today. Newborns, so those particularly in the first month of life, neonates, account for a, a very large proportion of the mortality that occurs in the first five years of life. This is a population that's particularly vulnerable, but it also means it's a, a very important target population for trying to improve outcomes for children overall. A large proportion of the deaths and the severe morbidity in young infants and in newborns is related to the quality of care and services that they receive in health facilities and within the health system. So we know that many of these deaths are preventable because newborn mortality is very unequally distributed, which means that we know solutions, we just don't have them equally distributed. And so a lot of my research is focused on trying to understand and evaluate potential opportunities to reduce those inequalities and to improve morbidity and mortality where we know that we have the possibility to do that. It's estimated that somewhere between 30 and 50% of all deaths in young infants are preventable with access to high quality care around the time of childbirth and in this first uh, period of the first month of life um, when something goes wrong and infants are, are sick or have a problem. The World Health Organization has targeted improving the care at the level of the primary health center. So the first point of contact, because this is the place where the majority of mothers and young infants go first for care. It's the service level which reaches the largest population. And it's a service level where there's opportunity for making big changes. We have evidence of what works. The challenge is to identify ways to bring settings where the level of quality and of capacity is lower um, in ways that are financially and logistically appropriate. There are evidence-based guidelines developed by the World Health Organization as part of a systematic approach to try to improve the care quality for not only young infants, but also for children in this primary care setting. They focus particularly on the assessment, classification, and management of the most common causes of morbidity and mortality in this population. But those of you who have worked in low resource settings will recognize these images well. These are clinics in low resource settings where health workers often are faced with enormous volume of patients. There are very few who are highly trained and specialized to provide care. They have long patient lines uh, providing pressure for them to be able to implement these guidelines. Also, guidelines are often out of date. There may be challenges at the national or the local level in dissemination of updates. They may be fragmented, so coming from many different problem or disease areas. And at the point of care, that makes it very difficult for a health worker be, to be able to implement these practices that we know are evidence-based and could have impact. This quote comes from some uh, interviews that we did with healthcare workers in Tanzania. And they were speaking about the guidelines and saying, we used these papers, we had these documents, um, but in the end, there's too much paper, too, too many things for us to balance, and it's unrealistic for us to be able to use them, even though we know that that's the best case scenario and that that's important for providing care quality, it's infeasible. So what's the potential of a digital tool to try to address this challenge? The World Health Organization has indicated that digital tools can be effective at the primary care setting to strengthen health systems and improve the quality of care. 
Digital tools can help to improve the uptake and adherence and fidelity with these guidelines so that health workers are using practices that we know can result in improved outcomes. They also allow for the integration of much more information into something that is more feasible at the point of care. So you saw in these pictures in Senegal, these walls of different guidelines. And the guidelines, even individually, are quite simple by design to make them more easily implementable. But that means when a child comes in that has a few different types of problems or many different symptoms, health workers have to integrate across these different guidelines at the same time at the point of care, which makes it quite difficult. Digital tools actually can simplify that process so that health workers are focusing particularly on the problems and characteristics of that individual patient, making the care more patient-centered. And considering things like risk stratification that we know have a big impact on the risk that a child faces. They also can, at the same time, support the collection of standardized health information that can be used by stakeholders at a centralized level for understanding the types of services that are being provided, populations that are being served, and where there's opportunities for impact. Clinical Decision Support Tools, or CDSA, are one type of digital tool. They are basically a way to take the information from a paper-based guideline and create a job support tool for health workers that systemize their mechanism for uh, conducting consultation, so which questions are asked, which tests are done, um, which evaluations are done, integrating that information into a recommended diagnosis, and then providing recommended treatment. They're recommended by WHO um, to guide health worker decision making in primary care settings to support that decision. So not to be deterministic, but rather to provide a, a tool for the health worker. There uh, is quite a lot of evidence to indicate that in some settings, in some populations, clinical decision support tools can be helpful in improving some outcomes. But the evidence is really varied across what works in what context. And so it's important to understand, um, based on the setting that we're in and working particularly in the young infant population where there's very little evidence, to learn more about what about these tools works and how can we implement them in a context that will have impact. So for the um, BRCCH project, I had the opportunity to develop a clinical decision support tool particularly focusing on sick young infants, as part of um, a nested project and a very large research infrastructure uh, across four different countries and uh, five different studies. After developing the algorithm, I then evaluated the impact of that algorithm on both clinical practices and clinical outcomes among the subpopulation of sick young infants in this larger study that was developed for providing clinical decision support for children up to 14 years. We conducted focus groups with healthcare workers to better understand the barriers and the implementation factors, so the context within which these tools were operating to learn about how to make them more feasible and more acceptable in that, um, in that context. And then part of what I'll do next, and I won't talk about it today because we're really in the very early stages, is to use machine learning to understand how we can improve the prognostic capacity of these empiric guidelines, so guidelines based specifically on the, um, the World Health Organization content, to provide um, more risk stratification and make them more predictive of poor outcomes, and then also to understand um, what influences the acceptance and the rejection um, from health workers of those tools so that we're learning about how to make them more acceptable. So as I mentioned, I had the opportunity to work within uh, two incredibly um, huge <laughs> and amazing research infrastructures that included a range of different both um, trials and implementation research. Um, the Dynamic Project, which was in Tanzania and Rwanda, and the Tools for the Integrated Management of Childhood Illness, which was in um, Tanzania, Kenya, Senegal, and also a component in India that I won't talk about today. These were studies, again, of clinical decision support uh, in primary care and point of care tests, so very simple assessments that can be used outside of an advanced laboratory capacity with the objective of improving the detection of severe illness, uh, improving appropriate practices, including antibiotic treatment, ultimately to improve clinical outcomes. And my work, as I said, was focused on the young infant population within these larger uh, infrastructures. So how do you go from a narrative or paper-based guideline to a digital tool? Um, 
Nigel, I'm sure, will talk more about the WHO SMART guidelines approach in his talk, but the World Health Organization has outlined five layers or progressive steps from a paper-based guideline to a point-of-care um, dynamic tool. This includes taking the content and making it operational. So this means setting a, a set of rule-based definitions um, and defining um, variables so that things are consistently used. It makes the content in these tools mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. There is then a level which creates um, something which can be machine readable, so readable, for example, by an Android um, or a, a software program, a level which is then um, uh, executable at the point of care, so on a tablet, for example, or a phone. And then a dynamic level which uses this information uh, on a global level to provide more patient targeted um, and precision medicine. So this is an example of WHO guidelines um, which we use to be able to develop this content that would um, create these algorithms for these tools. We focused on the WHO integrated management of childhood illness newborn module, which is for the, the under two month old. And then we adapted that for each individual country in which we worked because each country has a different set of national guidelines. And we tried to fill in places where there were gaps or questions that may not have been deterministic or where countries had multiple guidelines by using other evidence um, from global and national guidelines so that the care could be more comprehensive. This is then this operational level where you have code books of all the content in those algorithms and you create a sort of a decision tree for um, what happens based on how the child presents. And then we have this level of the machine readable. So this is the, um, at the level of the software. Um, so generally it would be a, a programming language, for example. Here we used a software that had a drag and drop process. And then ultimately you end up with something on the phone in the health worker's hands. This is a, an example of the piloting project um, where we had the chance in each country actually to, uh, with health workers in a supervised setting, to give them the chance to use the tool to see how it worked, to get feedback from them, what worked, what didn't work, what did they understand, what did they not understand, was the workflow feasible, did it fit within their regular um, caregiving practices, to ensure that what we were doing would be the most acceptable that it could be and that we were um, making it feasible for implementation. I also had the incredible opportunity to work directly with the World Health Organization in their Smart Guides, Guidelines Initiative for developing a um, digital adaptation kit, so the level two, for guidelines for caring for children in humanitarian settings. And Nigel will talk about that process later. Um, so I worked with WHO on the adaptation for the digital content and then um, worked with Cameroon and Iraq with uh, ministry and, um, and national uh, guideline developers in each of these countries to adapt the content and then pilot it for WHO's guidelines. So now I'll share some preliminary outcomes from the nested project um, within TIMC and Dynamic. And I would just say, first off, all of these results, with the exception of the um, results for Dynamic in Tanzania, are still preliminary. They're unpublished. So I would ask that you don't take any pictures or share them yet. We're close to dissemination, but we're not there yet. So we had, again, a range of cluster randomized control trials, pre-post studies. There was implementation research that include clinical observations of a subset of consultations for children. Um, under five and in my um, focus under two months to see what actually happened in the clinic, how was the tool used and implemented. And then I conducted interviews with health workers in Tanzania. Um, overall, there was almost 12,000 young infants in the, in the study across the different country settings and um, about 1,500 in the nested study where we did clinical observations. So overall, Health workers were broadly supportive in the qualitative research of the clinical decision support tools. They said they helped them feel more confident in decision making, helped them adhere better to guidelines. They simplified the consultation process, um, helped them to remember to do assessments that they knew they should be doing but sometimes forgot, uh, and helped them assimilate information across a, a lot of different resources that sometimes weren't always at the front of mind. So this is an example of just a, a page of one of the sections of the integrated management of childhood illness. So a child who presents with a problem 
is assessed systematically for a particular uh, history, signs, symptoms that would be associated with the major causes of um, severe morbidity and mortality. So all young infants should have a set of um, certain questions and assessments regardless of why they sought care. And then depending on what problems they present with and their individual characteristics, the health worker would then tailor the other tests, questions, responses based on those problems for a set of different syndromic areas. These results show from our clinical observations the proportion of young infants that were asked or assessed for each of the essential signs to identify severe illness in young infants. So the y-axis goes up to 100%, and the x-axis is um, an example of six different signs which all young infants should be asked regardless of why they sought care. So ideally, we would want that every young infant who comes to the health facility is assessed for each of these signs. So all of the bars would be at 100%. On the left-hand side, I show Tanzania, and then on the right-hand side, Kenya and Senegal because of the differences in the study design there. The gray bars are the control arms or the pre-intervention period, so what happened at baseline before the intervention started with the clinical decision support tool. And the blue lines are the coverage of these questions or assessments after we introduced the tool. In Tanzania, we did not observe any difference in the assessment overall of these signs in the intervention and control arms. And you can see all of those bars, even with the intervention, stay quite low. In Kenya and Senegal, the picture was a little bit different. So in Kenya, most signs were very infrequently assessed at baseline or in the control, and there was some slight improvement in um, the post-intervention period in these blue lines for many of these measures. In Senegal, there was quite high assessment actually in the pre-intervention period, and we didn't observe a change in the post-intervention period. So overall, uh, in Kenya and Senegal combined, there was a slight improvement in the total number of signs that were obsessed, but it was less than one sign different. So even with the intervention, still large opportunities for improvement. Why do we think that is? Many of the health workers reported that although they appreciated that the tool was more comprehensive, that also meant the consultation times were longer, and that made it much more difficult to implement when, particularly when there were few health workers and it was a high volume facility. There are many other potential reasons for challenges in implementation, but this was one of the main things that came across um, quite strongly in the qualitative interviews. So now we are looking at antibiotic prescriptions. Um, so while we recognize that antibiotics are an important treatment, uh, life-saving treatment for young infants that have infections, there's also large problems with antibiotic overuse in primary care um, where it may not always be appropriate. And so the, one of the major objectives was to try to improve appropriate resource use and target those resources for infants that would benefit. In the gray, again, you see the either control or pre-intervention um, proportion of young infants that received antibiotics in each country. Quite high antibiotic prescriptions, uh, around um, between 50 and 70% in the pre-intervention period, and then post-intervention in blue. And there were lower antibiotic prescriptions in three of the four settings in the pre-intervention period compared with the post-intervention period. So some improvement, but that was not consistent across every study. Why do we think that is? So health workers, again, reported the tool helped them in the decision-making process, helped them feel more confident in whether it was safe to withhold antibiotics, for example, um, helped them determine whether it was indicated based on guidelines. But they also said health um, caregivers come to the clinic with an expectation that they'll be treated with antibiotics and to not receive antibiotics, they feel unsatisfied with the care that they've received. They also reported being worried that young infants deteriorate very quickly and they didn't want to miss a severe case by accident. And they also shared a bit um, a sentiment of having a clinical judgment that needed to exist along with the tool. So even if there was a set of guidelines, they themselves had a certain clinical gestalt or feeling with the patient right in front of them. And the objective of the tool is not, again, to be deterministic. The objective is to provide support. So we don't want to discourage necessarily that they're using their, their experience and their clinical practice for that decision making. 
And then I'll share just this last outcome. So this is um, urgent referral. So the proportion of young infants who are urgently referred to a higher level of care, indicating that they had a severe illness and that they were then sent to a place that could prov provide more care. One of the objectives here was to use the tool to help ensure that severe cases that needed referral wouldn't get missed. Referral overall was incredibly rare, so it's probably too far for you to see in the back, but the top of this axis is 5%. So the uh, urgent referral rates were very low in all countries in the pre-intervention of the control arms, and there was little or no change uh, in the intervention period. Health workers explained that the tool helped them to make decisions around referral, but that there were still constraints in whether that referral was accepted or was feasible by the caregivers. They recognized that even as they were um, doing their best to make the right decisions about um, who needed to be referred, they recognized that that was often infeasible and that there were constraints around whether that referral would be accepted. And they were often hesitant to make the referral if they felt that it wasn't going to be accepted, recognizing that they could perhaps try to manage that, um, that infant where they were as opposed to sending them off without any care. So, Overall, key findings, the tool appeared to be acceptable to health workers for managing the population of sick young infants. They had quite positive feedback about um, the effect of the tool on um, a perception of improving the quality of the care that they were providing and the adherence with guidelines. And they, they reported that it was feasible to implement as part of their workflow. However, they also frequently reported that there were challenges to use it comprehensively around times of um, high volume in the facilities uh, and the constraints around human resources for health. And ultimately, this impacted the potential of the tool to change the types of practices that we know are associated with improving health outcomes for young infants. So I think we have a lot of questions, perhaps more questions than answers, to explore more the appropriate implementation setting and what we can do to make it feasible for health workers to use so that it, it can, in fact, change practice, um, ultimately resulting in the type of impact that we hope to have from a clinical standpoint. This is also part of what I'll do as part of the next step of this project to better try to understand using machine learning the um, decisions that health workers made when they agreed with the tool and they didn't agree with the tool. I would, before I finish, just like to acknowledge the incredible team of collaborators uh, at Swiss TPH as well as in each of the research countries where we had uh, research partners that led the implementation research. Um, in each setting, and we've worked with these groups now for almost five years, four years, <laughs> on this project, and it wouldn't have been possible at all without the teamwork of all of these players. I also want to thank WHO and, and Nigel and his team in MCA, as well as in the Digital and Public Health Group, for the opportunity to work with them on their digitization process. This helped me to really learn and understand from a WHO perspective how to systematize the process of digitization of a guideline. And I hope also gave me the chance to contribute to their project using what I was learning in the dynamic intimacy projects.